Good morning, welcome. Please stand with us this morning as we worship. We're going to continue worshiping, just singing of our Creator, stepping down in humble form and making a way for us to be reconciled unto the Father. Sing these lyrics out with me. Behold, the King has come. Oh 
you so much for being here and worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to our church. My name is Amy Haas, and I pro you've probably seen me if you've been around for a little bit. I work with the children, and I'd like to welcome you here today. Tonight is a very exciting no night around here. If you have done anything in the last year to serve as a volunteer, we'd like to invite you to come and celebrate with us with our Dream Team Christmas Party. Now, what that means is you need to sign up using the QR code. We have QR codes on the back of the seat in front of you and also on the screen up behind me. So I'm going to have you take out your phone if you haven't already signed up and scan that QR code in front of you now. But also, what that's going to allow you to do, if you're here for the first time this morning, you're also going to pull out your phone and you're going to scan that QR code and let us know it's your first time here. That way nobody has to feel awkward because we're all pulling out our phones and scanning that QR code. We want to welcome you here and let you know that we're happy to have you. If it's your first time, go ahead and stop by the welcome desk as you leave today, and we have a gift for you. This time of year provides a lot of opportunities to feel hectic and stressed. We want to think about it being a time of peace and calm and joy and happiness. But if you're like me, in all reality, that's not the way it feels. It feels intense and frustrating and just full of all kinds of events and things to get to. You know, that's not unlike Mary and Joseph. In the Bible, there was an event that happened. Mary and Joseph were sent to Bethlehem. They didn't want to go. They got an order that told them, you have to show up at Bethlehem. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody gives me one more thing on my to-do list, I feel frustrated. I feel anxious and overwhelmed, and I'm pretty sure Mary and Joseph felt that same way. No one wants somebody else to add one more thing to their to-do list. But what happened in their anxiety and stress was that we were offered eternal peace. We're going to read in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 about what happened because of their stress. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. We're part of that forevermore. We get to have that peace because of all of the stress and anxiety that was brought to Mary and Joseph so many years ago. We never know what our anxiety and our stress is going to provide for somebody else's peace in another opportunity. So today, we're going to light the candle of Bethlehem or the candle of peace. We invite you to stand and sing with us the next song. We're going to sing this familiar song together. Hark the Herald. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mine God in sin is reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King 
Christ by height. Christ by height, living a was a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the bridge was far too wide. From the south side of the chasm, 
You had me in your sight, so you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven thrones to be the hearing side, and there at the cross you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chain and freed my soul For the first time I had a hope right, Every voice, lift this up Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my Father, we thank you for the blood that you sent your son to die, to take on flesh, live a perfect life in order for us to be reconciled unto you, Lord. We just can't thank you and praise you enough 
for all that you've done for us through the power of your blood. I pray that you be with us today and as we go through the midst of the season, Lord, with all the distractions and all the things that consume our time, Lord, that we, that we just look to you in all things, Lord, and give you the praise that is due your name, that we truly have a sense of hope and peace and joy and love at this time of year because of what you have done for us, Lord, and all that you have provided. Be with us today as we dive into your word. Allow us to focus in on you and to live our life according to what you would have for us, Lord. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Wow, that was really lame right there. Good morning, church. Hey, there we go. There we go. Uh, man, I am excited to, uh, to spend uh, another Sunday morning getting ready to, to dive into Scripture today. Uh, raise your hand if you got a nativity scene in your house or outside of your house, all right? We, we know what nativity scenes are. We have all different things. I mean, the nativity scene is really all over the place. You see them uh, in, in Lowe's or Home Depot. You see them all around your life. You got the, the wise men here. Uh, even though wise men weren't necessarily there the night Jesus was born, we typically just overlook that theological truth and just blow right past it, <laughs> do it anyway. And so, so Mary, Mary was there uh, that day. Uh, and then what we, we often do, every nativity scene has some animals, right? And and it tends to make us think, if you're wired like me, it tends to make us think that, that Jesus was born in a stable, right? Raise your hand if when you think of a nativity scene, you think of a stable, like a, a little barn, right? right? Never mind the fact that archaeology and history would probably lend to the reality that it wasn't a stable, it was probably a cave, but we just forgo that, right? Let's just keep doing the thing that we do, right? And so, uh, of course, there is, um, I think this is supposed to be Joseph. Joseph always looks like a shepherd, so it's hard to tell. Uh, let's see, we'll do that. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, uh, there's definitely a shepherd. Shepherd's always holding a sheep uh, or lamb of some sort. Uh, we always have three wise men, even, oh, good grief, I almost broke it. Oh, that would have been devastating. <laughs> Oh, uh, everybody that's been here a really long time might have fired me right there, because uh, we have had this a long, long time. Uh, we always put three wise men, even though there is absolutely no record of there being three wise men. We just ignore that too. There were three gifts. For all we know, there were two, two wise men or 3,000. We don't know, uh, but we always put three. And of course, we always have the star of the show, Baby Jesus, right? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This right here, this is nice, Right? It's, it's pleasant. It makes us think of Christmas, right? It's nostalgic. Maybe you see this and it just makes you think of grandma's house at Christmas time, right? Maybe, maybe you know, um, if, if I was to, to lay out a hundred different nativity scenes, you would remember the nativity scene that was in your house growing up, if you had that growing up. You would remember right where it was placed, right? This is this is soft, it's harmless, it's nice. It often spurs Christmas cheer and joy equivalent to watching Kevin McAllister be re reunited with his mom at the end of Home Alone, right? It's nice, it's pleasant, it puts a smile on our face. Crazy thing is, this, this scene right here is perfectly okay in the world around us. Think about it. Mega stars sing about this. Secular stores, they sell this. Right? The people in your life that, that are far from Jesus, they're not bothered by this. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever wondered in the midst of our culture that you can't always like boldly proclaim the name of Christ without feeling overwhelming like embarrassment or, or just a flat out overwhelm? Like, like in the midst of all of this, this seems to be okay with everybody. No one's really ruffled by this. No one, like, like if you have this on your front porch, in our neighborhood, somebody has it like an inflated version, which is totally holy. I'm sure that's, that's righteous right there, but there's like an inflated version of this, and no one cares, right? Like, we're, we're not offended, like, how dare they do this? As a society, we're fine. Why? Could it be that, that the baby in the manger isn't perceived as a threat to our way of life? Now, a baby 
is a threat to a way of life. We do know that. Um, amen. Yes, yeah, some of you with little babies, like, like you know, remember, remember if you have children, remember what you would do on Saturdays before kids? Anything you wanted, anything. You would do whatever. Yesterday, I spent the day uh, six hours at a wrestling tournament with my son. He's right back here on the camera. He did awesome. Uh, but listen, I just preached on Sabbath. And I spent six hours, I should have, I told the, the first service, I should have brought a little candle, right, if you were here for that, to, to just have next to me, just to remember, okay, it's Sabbath, I can sit here, right? Like, 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 man, children change things, but oftentimes we see this and we're like, it's cute, it's, it's pleasant, it brings joy and a smile and nostalgia. But today, church, I want to remind you that the story of the nativity scene isn't pointed towards nostalgia. It's not meant to make you think of grandma's house. It's meant to spur something much bigger. It's to showcase the method that Almighty God would use to save his people, turn the world upside down, and give you a chance, a chance to escape the wrath of God. That's a little heavier than, oh, cute, a nativity scene. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it's a powerful phrase. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. That doesn't feel like Christmas right there. That doesn't make me want to have like hot chocolate and apple cider. Like that scares me out of my mind maybe. We're not sure about that. It's not as soft and cute as the baby in the manger. But this reality is the reason there is a baby in the manger. You see why the culture around us is totally fine with this. And very few people in your life are offended at the presence of this. Today we get the, the chance in the midst of our crazy schedules. Amy talked about the season, this time of year is so busy. Anybody busy right now? Oh my goodness. It's so busy. We get a chance this morning in the midst of this to just pause for a moment, just a few minutes this morning, and remind ourselves that this baby didn't stay a baby. He became a man. A man whose life, death, and resurrection intersects our life at every possible season we may find ourselves in right now. His life intersects our life. When, when we are without hope, he brings hope. Maybe we're in a season of despair and overwhelm, he brings hope. Right? When, when we're in a season of chaos and busyness and overwhelm and it's thing, thing, thing after one another, he brings peace. Right? We light these candles every week of the Christmas season. Hey, we're, we're here today and maybe we're in a season of despair or sadness or grief or mourning like the name of Jesus brings joy. Maybe we're here and we're consumed in loneliness. And we're just so tired of being alone. We're tired of no one getting what we're struggling with. Yet it is Jesus who brings love. You see, this, this baby grows into a man that gives us acceptance, forgiveness, and not just a life that escapes wrath, but a life that thrives in the midst of our world. See, the story of the baby is cute. It's cute, but the story of the man will change how you live, navigate your reality, how we function as a church, and how you will stand before a holy God. In short, the baby changes everything. He's not a cute little harmless baby. No, he is the son of God. He is God in the flesh, and he will radically change the course of our life. And to see this play out, we're going to get our Bibles out and turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read a passage in your Bible. It's probably titled, The Supremacy of Christ. And as we read this, we're going to, we're going to see why this, this baby didn't stay a baby, and it's not cute and harmless, and man, no, this, this changes everything. And so because this is speaking of the supremacy of Christ, I want us this morning to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Maybe this is familiar to you, maybe it's not, but let's read of how he didn't stay a baby in the manger. Speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. 
He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Amen? Amen. 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 You can have a seat. The supremacy of Jesus. He didn't stay a harmless little baby that's cute and doesn't spur any life change. First thing we see in this passage He isn't a harmless baby. He is our creator. He is your creator. You see, Jesus' existence didn't come into fruition that night in Bethlehem. He is eternal, right? John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on, you find that the Word is Jesus, right? He is eternal. Hebrews 1.8, an incredible passage uh, that, that highlights the supremacy of Jesus. It says this, but about the Son, He, the Father, But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. Don't overlook this. God the Father calling God the Son, God. This is a groundbreaking reality. It's altogether different than every belief system on the planet. God came to earth in the flesh. The baby is eternal. The baby is God, and the baby is creator. It said something that we just blow right past, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things. Everybody say all things. All things things were created by him and for him. You and I were created by Jesus and for Jesus. And this is an incredible thought because this passage is telling us why we were created. Have you ever wondered why you were born? Why is it that that you were actually born? We we tend to think it's, we we tend to like think of this question in different seasons of life. Maybe it's in the midst of despair and sadness and grief and overwhelm that we think this. Like I'm, I'm going through something so significant, why was I even born if it meant that I have to go through this? Maybe it's a a struggle that we have, that we're just bringing problem after problem into the world that we live, and so it would just make things easier on everybody else if I never existed. Why was I born? And that's a heavy season to be in. And maybe some of you know that battle, and maybe that battle is today. You wonder, why? Why was I born? Because everything around me seems to be crumbling. Why was I born? Other times, we often pose this question when we're connecting it uh, to our profession, strangely. We're connecting our purpose, the reason we exist, with what we do nine to five. And this makes sense because if you're like me, you want to be really good at your job. And so it makes sense that, that what we spend, it seems like the majority of our time doing, can, can feel like my purpose in life. But what happens when all of a sudden we're let go or what happens when we inevitably retire? As your pastor, I mean, I have a passion in in my profession, just like you do in yours. I want to be the best I can possibly be in my job, but it can't be my purpose because there's going to come a day I'm not your pastor, right? Every single pastor is an interim pastor. There was someone here before me, and there will be someone here after me, right? And so what happens if, if my purpose is to be a pastor? What happens when I'm no longer standing on a stage leading people? What happens if I'm, I'm not in some meeting and, and organizing some things? What happens if no one even cares that I'm at church on a given Sunday? What happens then? Do I still have purpose? What about for you? What about for you? What, what happens when, when you are no longer being asked for advice? What happens when you're no longer in the classroom? You're no longer taking someone's vitals. No one's asking you about the spreadsheet anymore. No, maybe you don't have kids in the home anymore, and so that ship has sailed. Like, what happens then? Do I not have any purpose? 
Because we do this. We tie the reason we're created. Our purpose in life is what we do nine to five, it seems. And so if we were to take that out, it feels like I have no purpose. But do we still have purpose? Well, Scripture would resound with a resounding yes, like an overwhelming yes. Your purpose is not tied to your mistakes and your grief. Your purpose is not tied to your nine to five. You and I were created by Jesus and for Jesus. You were created for Jesus. Now, we can operate our nine to five to bring him honor and glory, but we have to understand his honor and glory is the reason we have breath in our lungs. Everything is pointing towards him. Our purpose is to connect to him, to tell people about him, to have everything in our life shaped around him. So, so yeah, the baby definitely disrupts our life because we're supposed to form our entire life around him. The second thing we see in that passage is he isn't a harmless baby. He holds us together. Think about it. The artistry that is in our universe, you can just imagine, just kind of go through beautiful things in the created order. Think of the the symphony of the chirping birds and the roaring lions and and all the, 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 the noises that animal and mankind make, like in all of this, the the intricacies of your beating heart right now. The fine-tuned details of the, the baby that's in the womb. Scripture tells us that all of this is being held together by Jesus. It says this, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And while that tends to spur wonder and awe when we consider the physical realm, and it should, like, my goodness, it's incredible. The reality is, it often should spur a sense of overwhelming relief when considering the spiritual realm or the relational world around us. He can hold us together. In the midst of all that pulls us apart, He holds us together. The sin that has entangled us, the grief that is crippling us, the temptations that seem to be distracting us, the politics that divide us, the enemy that wants to destroy us. In all of this, it is Jesus that will hold us together. It is Jesus that will hold us together when our marriage is struggling. It is Jesus who will hold us together as a church as we turn the corner into another politically charged year where we will inevitably disagree with one another about a topic or two or three or ten. And the reality is, many a church have been divided over politics, and so we get a choice to to cling to those things or cling to Christ, and He's the one that holds us together. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When we stay connected to Him, the things that tend to divide can lose their grip we stay connected to him, he holds us together. So if there's something in your life right now that is pulling you apart, it's, it's yanking at your integrity and your character, it's, it's putting strain on your marriage, it's causing division in the church, like, like if there's things in your life that are pulling you apart from Christ, we must cling to him because he is the only thing that's strong enough to keep us united. It kind of leads into the next one. He isn't a harmless baby. He is the leader of this church. He is the leader of this church. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is to be the ultimate leader of Oak Hills Church, not not me or not some governing board. Because when you you put people on some pedestal, you, you set yourself up for disaster, right? Because I am more than capable of disappointing you and not meeting your expectations. And some of you are like, yeah, we know, right? Well aware. That's all right. That's all right. I, 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 I cannot fill that role. But Christ, when, when he is the head of Oak Hills Church, he will never let us down. And so when his mission is our mission, when his focus is our focus, when his value system is our value system, when that happens, the church is no longer a civic organization or a social club. 
It's no longer an echo chamber of our political ideologies. It is the body of Christ that is singularly focused on making disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus is the leader, we are a church that is passionate about one thing, making disciples. And when, we're, when we put somebody else on that mantle, we'll just to follow the, the passions of whoever that may be, for good or for bad. But when Jesus is the leader of our church, we have one passion, proclaim the name of Christ and make him known. Grow people in the discipleship of the Lord. He is the leader of our church. And finally, we mentioned this earlier. He is not a harmless baby right here. He gives us peace with God. Now, my guess is the overwhelming vast majority, maybe 100% of us in here, know that, that if you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to find miracle after miracle. That this baby grew up and, and he began to do incredible things, right? He walked on water, he healed the sick, he brought sight to the blind, he brought hearing to the deaf, he turned water into wine. I mean, he, he brought somebody back to life. It, it's incredible, all the things that he did. But, but everything that he did was pointing to something that doesn't seem to be miraculous. It's all pointing to him dying on a cross like a criminal with nails in his hands and his feet. And though this moment seems to be, you know, something that a thief deserves, it's our Savior that's being killed. And the bloody scene, the, the scene of blood and cruelty that, that the, the religious leaders were happy about, it, it didn't squash the rebellion like they thought it would. Instead, this, this scene that we often talk about at Good Friday, it results in you and I having a chance to have peace with God. What was the first thing we brought up? Without Jesus... We have wrath. Jesus is the one who saves us and rescues us from wrath. It's a difficult thing to talk about in the Christmas season. That when we breathe our last, there are two realities. One of wrath and one of peace. That's it. That we experience the wrath of God or the peace with God. And the only way we can claim the peace with God is if we have the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sin. So when we sing what we sang just a, a few moments ago of thank you, Jesus, for the blood, like this isn't, you know, oh, that's a good song, got a good beat. I like that. I like the melody right there. I like the, the electric guitar we got going in there. That sounds good. No, this is everything to us. We claim the blood of Jesus Christ. It's our only chance at peace. I want to read uh, Colossians 1, 19 through 23 one more time. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Then it starts to talk about us. Once you were alienated from God, enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, but now he has re reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. The reality is we're here today and some of us are consumed in sin and shame. We've done things that we are ashamed of. We've done things that, that maybe no one in this room knows about. And so we operate in this. We operate in this, just, this season of just disgust with ourselves over and over again. And maybe we keep coming to church, but we're just so disgusted with what we keep doing, or maybe no one even knows about it. But somehow, some way, the, the blood of Jesus covers this, that his actions on the cross allow the, the craziest of miracles. It allows sinful people like you and me. We have that in common. It allows us, in all of our, our weakness, in all of our struggle, to stand holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. It's crazy. Because you've done stuff, I've done stuff. We have things in our past, and maybe it's not a distant past, maybe it was yesterday, that just eat us alive. And, and here we have this reality that the one that was born would, would grow into a man, and that man would die on the cross, and his blood would reconcile us to the Holy Father, allowing us to be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And if you've been raised in church, you're like, yeah, I know. Got that. Don't miss 
the overwhelming importance of this theological truth. You and I are utterly hopeless without that blood. And so when we sing about it, we got to shout about it because somehow our wickedness is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. It must spur adoration. And so we see this reality that Jesus is the one that brings us peace with God. See, the story of the baby is cute. But the story of the man, it changes everything. It will change our life, how we live, how we navigate our reality, how we function as a church, and how we stand before a holy God. He is most certainly a threat to our way of life. And so as we go out, go throughout the Christmas season, and we see this all over the place, and we, we sing about it, and we hear songs about it while we're going shopping, may it just not be something else that we, we associate with Christmas. It is everything right here. The incarnation, the coming of God in the flesh. And so we got to wrestle with something this morning, each and every one of us. Do we live as though he stayed a harmless baby? Not do we believe he did, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that he grew into a man. But do we operate our lives seven days a week? Do we operate our lives as though he's harmless? He's cute. He loves you. Or do we operate our lives in light of the reality of who he is and what he's done for us? Because if the nativity spurs on nostalgia, which it often does, we're missing the point of all this. Because if we truly understand what, what this thing is, is representing, the birth of Jesus, it doesn't spur nostalgia and making me think of grandma's house growing up. It spurs overwhelming adoration and praise and, and a willingness to form my life around him in response to what he's done for me. So are we following a baby Jesus? Or are we following the Son of God who grew into a man that performed incredible miracles he died on the cross for our sins, and he raised from the dead three days later, giving us hope and a conquering of death. I wonder which one we're molding our life around. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we come to you thankful for this time of year, thankful that, that we can begin to tell stories that maybe we've heard our entire life, but, but we can begin to focus it and pointing it towards adoration and praise. Father, we come today maybe overwhelmed and in a difficult season. Maybe we're full of shame and regret. Maybe we have things in our life that are tearing us apart. May we see that our only hope is Jesus Christ. May we claim the blood of Jesus and, and praise him with everything that we have. May we form our lives around him. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I know we've read chunks of this in multiple ways. But I'm going to read that passage again. And as we, as we read this, I want you just to, to allow the Spirit of God to speak to you, to remind you of the power and supremacy of Jesus Christ, and to allow the Holy Spirit to, to impact whatever season that, that you may find yourself in, whatever nook or cranny of life that you need to be reminded of who He is. And so I'm going to read what we've already read says this about our Savior, the baby in the manger. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is your purpose. He is why you have breath in your lungs today. You were created to bring him honor and glory with every breath that you have. It says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I wonder what is pulling at your life right now, what is pulling at your relationships, what is causing division in our church, whatever it may be, that he is what's going to hold us together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the leader of all that we do. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Does he have supremacy in our life? Or do we have supremacy in our life? 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, and that's one of the most overwhelmingly significant transitions in the history of mankind, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you and me, I don't know how, somehow, holy in his sight, without blemish. You have no blemish. And free from accusation. You ever been accused? It's gone. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. God, we just come and praise you. That in the midst of our crazy world, you bring us peace. In the midst of all the things that can pull us apart, you hold us together. In the midst of all the things that we tie our identity to, you're the one that gives us purpose and meaning. So we praise you, Father. We praise you for the coming of our Savior. A story maybe we've heard hundreds of times. May it not just blend in. May it be everything to us. May it spur not nostalgia, but reverence, awe, and wonder. We praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and with one final song this morning, let's shout praises to our King with everything that we have. And we now have a chance to respond to the, the truth that we learned from God's word today. And we can do this in a couple of ways. If you need to pray, and if you need someone to pray with you, we have prayer partners up here that are willing to pray with you. If you just want to come forward, if you want to sit in your seats and take time to pray and just come before our God, you can do that as well. But we also get to respond by this corporate praise to him, by singing praises to his name in light of who he is and what he's done for us. And I want us to think on the significance of this idea that we were enemies of God but now we are adopted. We are children, sons and daughters of God through the blood of Jesus. And we get to exclaim today that he is Lord and he is Savior. And we're going to sing this chorus. It says, all hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail the Savior of the world. So let's sing this out together. Give him praise for what he's done. Recognition that every knee will bow before him one day. And he's worthy of all of our praise. this up every voice
up one more time. Today, you may be seated. And again, thank you so much for being with us on this kind of chilly Sunday morning. And there's just a couple of things that I want to remind you of. The first thing is what Amy mentioned earlier, and that we do have our volunteer Christmas party tonight. So at 6 o'clock, we would love for you to join us as we have some games and some food. And um, it's just going to be a great time of thanking you for all that you've done for our church this year. And the second thing is that this Wednesday night at 7.30, we're going to have our yearly membership meeting. And so there are some budgets out on the welcome desk if you want to take one of those and look over it. And besides all of the businessy things, we also will just be celebrating all that has happened in our church and the way that the Lord has moved in our church this year. And so that is Wednesday at 7.30. And then a week from today is going to be our big day of giving. So every year we take one Sunday, usually towards the end of the year, and we choose one of our ministry partners, and that day, that offering that's given throughout that time period goes towards this ministry partner. And so this year, it's going to the Myers. They're moving from Thailand to Vietnam, and so with this, they have to sell all their furniture. They have to buy new furniture, and so our offering and our gift to them this year will be able to help them in their move, and they're actually moving this week. So it's a great time to give and to really help them in their ministry. And then Surviving the Holidays is a, an extension of the Grief Share. And so it happens every Friday night from now until Christmas. And these nights are individual. So it's not a series that you have to continually go to. Every Friday night is a separate night. And so we have, I think, two more from now until Christmas. At 6.30 every Friday night, we have those Grief Share 
um, session support groups that if you are in need and would like to join, then you are more than welcome and we'd love to have you. And then finally, on your way out, and you've actually probably seen them in your chair, we have these Heaven Came Down postcards. And these are intended for you to take and short, put on your fridge, but also we want you to hand these out. And so if everybody here would take five and pass five out, over 250 people would be invited to our Christmas Eve service. Because we are going to have services on Christmas Eve, 930 and 11. And we would love for you to come. But again, we would also love just for you to invite your neighbors, invite your family and friends. And hopefully we won't have any more of these left by the end of today. So as always, there are three ways to give. You can give online through automatic giving or through debit or credit card. You can give, um, you can text to give 84321 or you can give in the black box, boxes in the back of the room. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I thank you for the people that you have brought to our service today and for the people who serve you week in and week out. Thank you for what you've done for us, that you came to earth as a baby, but a baby who grew into a man that died for our sins. And because of that, because of what you've done for us, we have hope and we have peace and we have love for you. So thank you for all you've done for us. Please keep us safe and bring us back next week. In your name I pray, amen. As always, we're going to end with our mission statement. So we are striving to be. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend. Oh, hold on, everybody. So since we're having our volunteer party tonight, we need volunteer help to prepare for the volunteer party. So we're going to set up 16 tables with six chairs apiece. If you feel led to stick around for that, we would love the help. If not, we'll see you tonight.